Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring it to be written here in our Bibles and preserving it all this time so that we can, here in 2024, read it and apply it to our hearts and lives. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here that's not saved, I pray that they'll be saved. Pray for each one of your people, Lord, to help us, Lord, to uh, apply these truths to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> J.C. Penny, the, you know, the guy from J.C. Penny's stores in the States, which we don't have up here in Canada, but J.C. Penny apparently at one point in his life made some very unwise commitments, and because of that he became very depressed. He worried so much that he developed shingles. He went to see the doctor. He was admitted to the hospital, and his condition got much worse. And one night he was prescribed a sedative, and that quickly wore off, and he awoke, believing that he would die that night. He wrote letters to his family and fell asleep. Well, the next morning he woke up, and uh, he was surprised that he was still alive. And he heard people singing in the chapel, God will take care of you. And he went into the chapel. He listened to the singing and the message with a heavy heart, but then something happened, he said. He said, I realized that I alone was responsible for my troubles. I knew that God with his love was there to help me. And he said that from that day forward, he lived his life worry-free because from that day forward, he realized that God cared for him. God cares for you. God will take care of you. We sing that song. Do we believe it? We, our theme this week has been much more, much more in 24. We've seen three, two things so far. First, we have much more than just justification. Not that justification is something to slight. So justification is something amazing. And yet we have much more than justification. And we saw last night that we have much more grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But tonight, we see in this passage of Scripture, we have much more of his care. Much more of his care. God cares for us. This text is teaching us that we can trust our lives to God because he cares for you. Our text introduces us to two very small things. First, there's the fowls of the air. Most likely, it's referring to a, a sparrow, like in Luke chapter 2, that are two sparrows sold for a farthing. Uh, two sparrows, they're very small, tame. They're found everywhere. Because of their great number, they were sold very cheaply. But 
they'd sell them for just a little bit. And yet, the fowls of the air, it says in our text, they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? God takes care of the sparrows. Don't you know that he takes care of you? Then secondly, he refers to the lilies of the, va- of the field. Consider the lilies of the field in verse number 28. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If God cares for the little sparrows and the little lilies, don't you know he cares for you? And so tonight, it actually says in the text, much more he cares for you. And so tonight, I want to think of these, this whole text, Matthew 6, verse 24 to 34, and consider our response then to the fact that God cares for us. He cares for us. That ought to affect something. That ought to change something in our lives. How ought we to live knowing that he cares for you? And so I was told last night, and I kind of read into it while I was preaching that my outline was a little far too complicated. So tonight, you have three blanks, and they're very easy, and uh, we will uh, make sure that I say them, <laughs> which apparently I didn't do last night. And when I wrote down something different, that's what happens. But number one, since God cares for you, number one, he cares for you so much more, for you so much more, so serve him, serve him. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. The fact that he cares for you ought to make it so that you serve him, that you live for him. What is mammon? The Bible says you can't serve God and mammon. Name is just a fancy way of saying wealth. They're saying money, saying things, material things. And it's pretty obvious that you can't serve two things, you know? You can't serve two masters. Uh, today, people, they like to share custody. They might even share employees. But a slave can't have two masters. In those days, masters had their servants at their beck and call, and they had to be able to drop everything at a moment's notice for their master Not really doable today, but that's what was expected back then. But imagine a slave with two masters and both of them are trying to call you at the same time. You know, sometimes you might have that. You might have someone knocking at your door and you might have someone calling you on your phone. What do you do in that situation? It's impossible to, to please everybody. It's impossible to serve everyone at the same time. Who are you to serve? Well, you serve the Lord. That's who you serve. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I think every Christian will say that he needs to live for God. That's something that's pretty obvious in the scripture. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's just what makes sense. When you think of what Christ did for you, it makes sense for you to serve him. Every Christian will admit that he's wanting to serve the Lord. But the question that we battle with, or what we battle with, is that, well, I still need to care for me, though, you know. I still got to take care of myself. I still need to watch out for my own interests. How often do you hear that in the world? You know, you got to take care of you. You got to make sure that you're taken care of. You got to watch out for number one. Nobody else is looking out for you. You got to look out for yourself. You got to put yourself first. That's the world's mentality, isn't it? Take care of you. You, you, you. You are the most important. You are number one. And while we know, you know, obviously you got to work and you got to do different things. The fact is the number one in a Christian's life is to be the Lord. Serve him first. Make him number one in your lives. And what you notice in the scripture is that when people serve the Lord, They put his needs before their own. 
they put him first. When, God, when the Lord Jesus Christ called Peter and Andrew, they had just caught a lot of fish. Do you remember that, Luke chapter 5? They had just caught a lot of fish. Uh, it doesn't tell us, I think, in Luke chapter 5, another passage of Scripture, they caught 256 fish. That's a lot of fish. They had just had a lot of money that was just sitting there in the boat. And they left all and followed him. They left that behind them. James and, and John, they left their dad behind in the boat. Uh, Matthew left the receipt of custom and followed him. But what about our needs? What about, what about their needs? Aren't they, aren't they foolish that they left their own, their own ways of making their own money behind them? Well, it wasn't that they were fools. They just were follow, serving Christ. And you know, when Christ calls someone to serve him, he takes care of them. If someone works for the king of England, I assume that he'd make sure they're taken care of. When someone works for a, a wealthy corporation, they, they take care of that employee. Well, when someone works for the king of kings and lord of lords, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, don't you know he takes care of them? He takes care of his own. And the Bible is reminding us he cares for you. So you just focus on serving him, making sure that you live as a Christian. Yes, we have to have jobs. Yes, we have to have different things. But when you're at work, serve the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're at school, serve the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're, uh, when you're um, at home, serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Every aspect of your life, serve him. And he'll take care. He'll take care of you. I love when Elijah went to Zarephath. There was a widow there in a time of famine with nothing. All she had was a little cruise of oil and a little bit of flour, just enough to make one cake so her and her son could eat it and die. And Elijah said, first make me a cake. No, no, you didn't hear me. This is all I have left. I don't have anything else. Yes, but Elijah said, first give it to me. And then the Lord of Israel says, that the cruise of oil will not run out, will not, will not fail the whole time he was there. Put God first. He'll take care of you. Since he cares for us, that means we can serve him. Serve him first. Since he cares for you, number one, serve him. And number two, since he cares for you, number two, stop worrying. Stop worrying. In verse 25 to 30, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into burns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit onto a stature? Do you know how much a cubit is? About 18 inches. You make it from your elbow to the tip of your hand. Can you add 18 inches to your height just by thinking about it? I didn't think so. Um, and why take ye thought for raiment? Verse 28. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And notice how he ends this verse. O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. In other words, can't you just trust God? Can't you just trust God to meet your needs? Can't you just trust him to take care of you? That's the thing is we see our needs and we think, I, gotta, I, I, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how this is going to work. You imagine those disciples. I got I, Peter, he's got a mother-in-law. He's got a wife. He's got a family back home to take care of. You get different ones, they have different needs. How, what about this? What about that? I, how am I going to afford this? How am I going to make this happen? How am I going to, what if this happens? What if that happens? Don't worry about it. Just trust the Lord. Take no thought. It's not that we don't plan for the future. It's not that it's wrong to have any strategy for tomorrow or anything like that. It's that 
when you know it's God's will, you do God's will. And whether it makes sense to you or not, you still do God's will. You still follow the Lord, regardless of whether or not you yourself can see the solution in front of you. Whether or not it makes sense to you, if you know it's God's will, you do God's will. You do what he is calling you to do. These men, they were being called in something that no one else is ever going to be called to do at this point in time, because they were called to follow the Lord, walk in his footsteps, walk right behind him. I get jealous of them, I tell you. I, I, uh, I wish I had have been there for those three and a half years. But anyways, they got to, but they were called away from their home. What They were called away from all their family, all their business things, all, all their work that they were doing. How in the world were their needs going to be met? Just follow him. He'll take care of you. And God in our lives, he'll sometimes put something in our heart. This is what I want you to do. This is my will for your life, especially for teenagers, for young people. They're planning their futures. I, I know this is what God wants, but I have no idea how it's going to work out. You just follow him you step by step, day by day. You can't, you can't think of, you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You have no idea what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now. You have no idea what the future holds. But today you can do his will and follow him. Follow him and just trust the unknown to him. Trust the future to him. He's proven all the time that he takes care. He cares for the sparrows. He cares for the lilies. He cares for those little things in life that that we that we are, are that we don't even think of that we would never consider to care for he cares for them i guess some of us do we do have a bird feeder now my kids like to watch the birds feed in our bird feeder and so we feed a few of the birds these days and uh and then my wife started planting some flowers and things i don't understand it but anyways apparently they're pretty that's what i've heard <laughs> i don't know but we have tulips in our front in our flower bed and different things anyways but uh some of us, left to our own devices, <laughs> will not care for these things whatsoever. <laughs> but your Heavenly Father does. He cares for them. Even the lilies of the field, just some random field out on the highway, you see them grow. My mother used to stop along the highways in Nova Scotia and with a shovel, and we pick some of the flowers and transplant them home. I don't think you're allowed to do that anymore. Maybe you weren't even allowed to do that then. I have no idea. <laughs> but many times in my life, I was on the side of the highway with a shovel and my mother <laughs> digging up flowers. And sometimes it was even the stones that she was after. But anyways, <laughs> I'll get my mother in prison one of these days. <laughs> but we don't even care about those things. But God does. And so if he cares for them, don't you think he'll care for you? You know what it is when we, the thing is we say, but I, I got to take care of myself. I got to make sure that it makes sense to me. I got to make sure that I, have a, that I have it all worked out myself ahead of time before I take this step of faith. And sometimes it's wise. It always is wise to plan. I get that. But... If you know God's calling you to do something and you got to know all the answers ahead of time, what you're doing is saying, Lord, I don't trust you. You're saying, Lord, I don't, I don't believe you're dependable. I don't believe that you are trustworthy. And as Christians, we got to just trust him. Trust him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him or and or. We need to learn how sweet it is to trust in Jesus. Do you trust Jesus? I don't know about you, but if a friend tells me they don't trust me, that hurts pretty bad, doesn't it? You want your friend to trust you. You want your loved one to trust you. Well, God wants us to trust him. He says, I know what you need. I know what's bothering you. I know what is your concerns are. Just trust me. Live the way that God prescribes in his word and trust him with the results. Trust him. We can, because of his care, we can stop worrying. We can serve him. We can stop worrying. And then last of all, because he cares for us, number three, because he cares for us so much more, number three, we can seek him first. 
Seek him first. Where, verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. He'll take care of that stuff. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, verse 34 is telling you, live one day at a time. Live one day at a time. Because what you need to do is seek first the kingdom of God. We already said back in verse 24 that we need to serve him. But here, as we think of these verses, I believe the call is to make him our, our treasure. Make him the one we're seeking after. You seek after that which is valuable to you, that which you love, that which you desire. Seek God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He needs to be the top of the list. Spurgeon tells the story of a young man who confessed his decision to trust Christ, and it actually offended his father. And his dad said to him, James, you should first get yourself established in a good trade, and then think of religion. But the son said, Dad, Jesus Christ advises me differently. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first. And what are you seeking? What are you seeking first? The fact that he cares for us makes me realize that he has what I need, but also he has what I should want. He has what the, the best prize, the best life comes from seeking him first. All these ones going after mammon, going after these different things of the world are missing out on the best thing. They're missing out on the Lord. And we need to seek him first. And I got to think whatever it is that he has is far better than whatever th other things we could be seeking. In Matthew chapter 19, we have the story of a rich young man coming to Jesus asking what he had to do to obtain eternal life. And Jesus said, you know, the commandments do, that thou shalt um, honor thy father and mother and the different commandments he gave him. He said, all these things I've kept from my youth up. And Jesus knew his heart. He said, one thing you lack, sell all that thou hast and give to the poor and come follow me. And the man heard that and he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. And he went away. He didn't follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus saw him walking away, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the people heard that and they said, Well, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, With man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. And it was at that time that Peter spoke up. You know, Peter always had something, something to say. We give Peter a hard time, but hey, he preached and 3,000 souls got saved in one day, so he's a good name in my books. But anyways, Peter spoke up, and he said, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Kind of asking, what's in it for us? We did what this verse says in Matthew 6, 33. We sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What are we going to get for this, this step of faith? And Jesus gives him an answer. In verse 28, he said unto him, Matthew 19, 28, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he says in verse 29, and everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. And it will be worth it to follow Jesus. He always pays. It's always worth it to live for him. But as Matthew 20 begins... You might as well turn there. I don't know how much I'll read of it, but Matthew 20, 
as it begins, it really it picks up where chapter 19 left off. Now, you know the chapter divisions were given for us to help find our way in the Bible, but the, when Matthew first wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he did not put the chapter divisions there. And so chapter 20, verse 1 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. He's talking, he's carrying on this conversation from chapter 19, talking about now a, a, this householder hiring laborers for his vineyard. And he goes out, and I'll just tell you the story. At, nine, at first, at the very beginning of the day, he finds these laborers, and he hires them, and these laborers must have had to agree to a certain amount. So in Matthew 20, verse 2, they agree to a penny a day. That's a fair day's wage in those days, believe it or not. Inflation really has hit, hasn't it? It's not Canadian money. I have no idea what a penny would relate to in our, in our terms. But anyways, they received a penny a day, and that was a fair wage. So they said, sure, we'll take it. And they came, and they worked in his vineyard. Then he went out three hours later, the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. There he sees some, and they don't have to agree with anything. They, they're just like, yes, we're happy to go work. And he says, whatsoever is right, that I will give you. And they went and they worked. They had no idea how much they were going to get. They, they probably figured probably not a penny because we're not working the whole day. We're taking a few hours to get there. So whatever he gives us, that will be fair. And so they go at nine o'clock in the morning, and then he goes back at noon, sixth hour of the day, goes back again at the ninth hour of the day, at three o'clock in the afternoon, hires more laborers both times. Then he goes out at the 11th hour of the day. That's five o'clock. They stopped working at six o'clock. He goes at five o'clock, and he still sees more people in the marketplace that aren't working. Why are you sitting all the day idle? Go work in my vineyard. Whatever's right, that I'll give you. And so they say, sure, we'll go work for one hour. I mean, who's, who's not going to not work for one hour, right? <laughs> and so they go and they work for the one hour. And at the end of the day, the good man of the house, he gathers everyone together and he's starting to give them their pay. And he starts with the ones that worked one hour of the day. And how much does he give them? He gives them a penny. That's what they got. The whole day's wage a penny for their working one hour. Goes to the guys who worked three hours, gives them a penny. The guys that worked six hours, gives them a penny. The guys that worked nine hours, gives them a penny. Comes to the guys that worked all day. Worked from six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. For the burden and the heat of the day, they sweated, they toiled. What a hard and long day it was as they worked in the vineyard. What do you think they're going to get? Well, they're doing the math. If the guys that worked one hour got one penny, I think we should probably get 12 pennies, don't you think? This would be quite the payday. This man's really paying generously. But what they got was what they had agreed to. They got a penny. And they murmured and they complained. And the good Lord, the good man of the house says, Are you murmuring against me because I'm good? Uh, you agreed with me to work for a penny. I gave you a penny. Can I give what I want to who I will? And, and I, I, on, I honored your contract, he said to them, basically. And why do you murmur against me? Because I'm good. And I think of that parable. What is the Lord teaching us? Some take it to mean that heaven's the same for everybody. No matter what happens, your heaven's the same for all of God's children. I, I don't believe that. I believe that our rewards will vary based on the works that we did. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, our rewards will vary. So he's not saying that we all get the same rewards in that sense. But what's he saying? Well, I believe there's three lessons here. First, God's sovereign. Who are we to make demands from him? God's sovereign. God is impartial. He doesn't have favorites. He doesn't he, he, he's always fair in his dealings. But then the third lesson I think he's teaching is God is good. You can trust him to do what's right. Peter followed the Lord and he said, what am I going to get? What's in it for us? I left my home behind, my family behind. I left my fishing career behind. I left it all and followed you. 
What, 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 I, I trusted you with a lot. I, what are you going to do for me? And the Lord's saying, Peter, don't worry about it. Don't worry about what the reward is. Don't worry about the sacrifice. Don't count your losses. Just know that God is good. And when the time comes to be rewarded, it's always going to be worth it. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. He's kind. He's loving. He's good all the time. I don't know about you. Maybe you came to church and you're a little, a little tired, maybe a little beaten down, maybe a little overwhelmed and wondering, is it worth it? All this work for the Lord, is it worth it? It's always worth it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's always worth it to put God first. Always worth it to live for him. Always worth it to make the sacrifice to serve the Lord because he's good. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. And he cares for you. As Peter is the one that wrote the words, we can cast all our care upon him for he careth for you. Because he cares for you, you can serve him, stop worrying, and seek him first. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the text that was before us this evening as we considered um, your much more care. We thank you, Lord, that you care so much about us so that we can seek you first and serve you and, um, and, and not trust you and not, not worry, Lord. I pray, Lord, that will be the Christians you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.